Hi, this is Yusuf Xenogiannis and Manos Brilakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute and the Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation, presenting case 39 for the manual of non-CTO coronary intervention. This is a case when multiple things went wrong, however, it had a happy end. The patient was an elderly man who presented with chest pain and was found to have an inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. He was a diabetic and had a, pre a PCI performed 20 years prior. This is his EKG and blood pressure at baseline. We did perform emergent coronary angiography using right radial axis. We had difficulty engaging the coronary arteries due to subclavian tortuosity, but we were able to see no significant lesions in the left coronary system. However, there was a severe lesion in the mid as well as the distal right coronary artery, the distal actually being within a previously placed stent. The plan was to perform primary PCI, however, we did have significant difficulty engaging the right coronary artery. We failed using an AL 0.75 and an AL 1 guide catheter, but were eventually successful with a night carry right. However, upon engagement, there was uh, acute uh, cessation of flow, acute vessel closure, likely due to guide dissection. We did try to advance guide wires into the true lumen, both workhorse as well as polymer jacketed. However, we were not able to do so. In the meantime, the patient uh, developed worsening ST segment elevation, and given the difficulty we had with support and uh, getting back into the true lumen, we decided to change into femoral axis. We were able to get access into the vessel with a guide wire. However, we had difficulty advancing the guide wire past the external iliac because of calcification as well as an external iliac aneurysm and in the process the arterial axis was actually lost. We held manual pressure and then were able to obtain access on the left femoral artery. We were then able to engage the right coronary with an 8 friends JR4 guide and then did try to use a stingray balloon to get back into the true lumen which is a device used mainly for CTOs, but it has been used in this setting of acute vessel closure and dissection in an attempt to get access into the distal vessel, but unfortunately, the wire here did remain subintimal. In the meantime, however, the patient developed hypotension, and when we did fluoroscopy of the groin, we can now see displacement of the bladder towards the left of the pelvis, which suggests that a retroperitoneal hematoma has formed into the right side of the pelvis, and this is called the intended bladder sign and was confirmed by doing an injection from the left uh, iliac into the right iliac artery. There is indeed a perforation with active bleeding into the retroperitoneal cavity. As we do in every perforation, the first step is to inflate a balloon to stop the bleeding into the retroperitoneal space. An 8 by 20 balloon was inflated. And then the next step is to actually try to get a cover stand. However, we were not able to get a cover stand because of a calcification in the presence of the aneurysm. And in the midst of all this, the patient developed ventricular fibrillation. He did have some hypotension. He did get defibrillated, but he did remain hypotensive. Eventually, he had cardiac arrest and the Lucas device had to be placed. In the meantime, the surgeons had come into the room and given the inability to deliver a cover stand, they performed a cut down on the right uh, groin in order to control the bleeding, but now have the patient essentially in cardiac arrest with the Lucas device. So what was done, the patient was actually placed on ECMO. The venous cannula was placed surgically into the iliac vein and uh, a 17 French arterial cannula was placed in the left common femoral artery. And after that, the patient was stabilized, although required a lot of blood transfusion as well as uh, fluids. We then uh, um, obtained left radial axis and with left radial axis, we had a little better support. So we decided to see if we could recanalize the occluded right coronary artery. We did a brief attempt for retrograde crossing. 
However, there were no good collaterals and we could not cross into the PDA. We eventually used um, a subintimal technique. This was a knuckle that was advanced all the way around the previously placed stents to the distal right coronary artery. And then we delivered a stingray balloon with difficulty after multiple predilations. And finally, using a Gaia third guide wire, we were able to re-enter into the distal true lumen, followed by placement of four drag eluting stents. We did intravascular ultrasound showing some stent under expansion requiring repeat balloon inflations. But in the end, we did restore undergrade flow into the distal right coronary artery, which actually did help the patient stabilize because the patient did have multiple episodes of ventricular fibrillation. And after flow was restored, then the patient could be defibrillated back into sinus rhythm. He did have an extensive uh, post-hospital stay with um, hypoxemic encephalopathy. However, he was decannulated two days later and he had a, a fairly good recovery with dismissal to a dehabilitation center 17 days later. Several components in this case can be discussed. The, finish, the first one is the radial versus femoral. One can argue that radial has less bleeding complications and that's exactly what happened in this case the bleeding complication came from the femoral axis, but at the same time, the radial can make guide manipulations harder, and that can result in other complications like acute vessel closure from potentially guide-induced dissection. So it's never 100%, and each axis does have plus and minuses. However, for most patients, radial axis does remain the preferred axis for patients with STEMI. At the same time, uh, when there is difficulty engaging the vessel or recanalizing, then the femoral axis can provide better support. However, it does have the risk of access complication, as was uh, the case in this particular patient. So, in summary, several lessons from this case. The first one is that acute vessel closure can potentially be a lethal complication. Had we not placed this patient on ECMO, he probably would not have survived. Number two, in patients with hypotension, one easy way to screen for retroperitoneal hematoma, provided that contrast has been given at least a few minutes earlier, is uh, to perform a fluoroscopy of the pelvis, and if the bladder appears to be displaced, that suggests retroperitoneal, he retroperitoneal hematoma. Number three, when the patients go in cardiac arrest, then starting them on ECMO, on VA ECMO, can uh, sustain them, keep them alive, allowing for the intervention to be completed, followed by decannulation a few days later. And finally, in patients with acute vessel closure, when there is significant difficulty advancing a guide wire into the true lumen, use of CTO techniques, in this particular case, knuckling around the previous stand and re-entering distally, followed by stand placement, can restore patency of the vessel and facilitate recovery. Thank you.